God according to His will. Believe God according to His will. See, a lot of us, we know about the believe God part. But we have to believe God according to His will. Now, let's look at this in two parts. We're going to be focusing on just two sections today. The first section that we need to look at is the modern Christian in faith. You can put in parentheses the act of believing. So we're not talking about necessarily the Christian faith, or right? just the ability to have faith. To live life requires faith. To live life requires faith. When you wake up in the morning, you believe that you can move. And because you believe that you can move, your brain sends the command for your body to move. And you believe that when, you're, when you want to move your hand and when you want to move your foot, it will move. Now, sometimes we complain about this pain and that pain, but the bottom line is it still moves. To go to work requires faith. We believe that we'll get there safely. We believe that the public transportation, whatever, um, whichever one we're taking, or if you drive, you believe that on the way driving, the car will be fine. And if you're walking, you believe that your walk will be fine. It requires faith. We get to our jobs. The contract that we signed, we believe in good faith that when we do our work, that our bosses and our employers will pay us. Oh, minister, we have a contract that they have to pay us. No, not really. <clears throat> they can break the law if they want to. There's nothing that's stopping them from breaking the law. There might be consequence, but, but they can. And what it, the amount of, you know, work it will take to go into the court and run it through with them, it's, 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 a, it's a lot of time to try to resolve something like that if they decide, hey, I am not going to pay you. So it can be resolved, but it'll take some time. You know, all that time, you just haven't received your money yet. So even in that area, we it all requires faith. We believe in ourselves. Oh, yes, we do. We believe that if we work hard enough, we'll get somewhere in life. We believe that, you know, for those of you who immigrated to this country, you believe that if you come to America, life will be better. You don't know what kind of better. You might have your dreams and aspirations and think, oh, I'm going to make a lot of money or whatever. But the bottom line is you're saying, when I leave my home country that I love, I'm leaving because I believe this new country I'm going to is going to be better. And that everybody came to America was saved. So the act of believing is required for everyday life and all the things that we do. The faith exists all by itself. We can put our faith in objects. We can put our faith in substances. We can put our faith in food or drink. We can put our faith in people. We can put our faith in a deity or religion. We can put our faith in our plans. We can put our faith in our desires. That can keep on going on and on and on. And the Bible actually uses a very pe a peculiar example for this. If you go to Matthew 8, chapter 9, you can just write that down. I'll read the scripture for you. And it says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. That was the centurion talking to Jesus when he was asking Jesus to come to him and to heal his servant. I remember he said to Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. I'm not worthy of you to come to my house. But it was the fact that the centurion has faith in his own authority. And the centurion expressed the faith that he has that when I give a soldier a command, when I give my servant a command, they will do it. Notice, he never said, I'm going to take up my whip and I'm going to beat them and then they're going to do it. No, he said, when I tell a soldier to go or come, he goes or he comes. When I tell my servant, do, he will do. That is faith. That's faith in, uh, uh, in his own authority. 
So we as human beings, we have faith in our own perceived authority, our own perceived ability, our own perceived plans, our own perceived desires, our own perceived wants and needs. We have belief within ourselves. So when someone tells you my faith is running low, don't believe them. Their faith is not running low. It's just running low in a particular situation. They have plenty of faith. Because if you, if you don't have no faith, you might as well die. Because even your human body believes in, it, in itself to stay alive and to survive. That's the reason why the body constantly tries to regenerate itself. Think about it for a moment. We start dying from the moment we turn 25. You, you're basically, quote unquote, building toward life until you're 25. And then once you hit 25, your body starts dying. Yet, when you cut yourself, your body still blood clots and stops the bleeding and still heals itself. Even though you're still dying. If you get sick and you take medicine, your body, while it is quote-unquote dying, still gets up within itself and fights back against the infection, fights back against the virus, fights back against the disease. Oh, minister, I have to take medication. The medication is there to help the body. It's not there to replace it. It's there to help and assist the body. The bottom line is the body is still fighting. Why? Because the body believes in itself to survive even when it's dying. So when someone says, I have no faith, don't believe them. The centurion knowing the faith that he had within himself and recognizing authority, as a matter of fact, that's why he looked at Jesus the way that he did. Because he said, I recognize, I see the same thing in, in the same thing I see in myself, I see in you. You are a man of authority. I have command over soldiers, you have command over diseases and sickness and health. You, have, you clearly have command over that. So I'm going to go to you and I'm going to make my request known because I believe in your authority. It all comes down to faith. Hebrews 11, 1 to 2, we know the scripture very, very well. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. We know that faith it just it's, it's, it's just, it's just need, it's needed. You, 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 you strive towards something, you don't receive it yet, you're constantly believing I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. Now, the issue now becomes for us as Christians sometimes is that we, are ta we take the act of believing and we don't put it in the prism of Christianity. Because there's a lot of people who pray to God to kill somebody. All right. That's a, that's a bit much. There's a lot of people in their anger, in their frustration, in their grief, ask God to kill people or to give them the strength to kill somebody. They are believing God to commit murder. Believe in God to give them the strength to go and fight. You know, um, um, uh, I don't know, this might have been a couple years ago. Um, we all know Steve Harvey, the comedian, right? Yeah. And Steve Harvey one time, I think, I think it might have been on TVN. He was speaking because he said, you know, he, he converted to Christianity fully. So, okay. And he was speaking and he was saying how when they had the comedy show, they would all band together. Now he said, we're about to go up there and say some things that are, they might be funny for real, but the, the content, the subject of the content is not exactly pure. Let's put it that way. It's a little bit dirty, a little bit dirty. And he's like, we're about to go out there and say all this crazy stuff. I'll have got our jokes ready. But he's like, yet we are gathering behind the stage, joining hands to pray. And you want to know something? I understand exactly where he's coming from. Because when I was going to do my performances, when I was in school, and, we were going to, and we're going to do classical music, and we're not talking about like the, 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 like the Bach chorales that is actually based in Christianity now. We're talking about just any classical piece, wind ensemble, string ensemble, choir, the, the whole night. And the few of us that are Christians, we band together and say, Lord, help us in this performance. 
even though we're not playing his music. <laughs> and we pray the prior for God, for everything to go well, even though we're not doing his stuff. We're not doing his will in that moment. We're not doing his music. We're not doing his kind of performance and all that. And if you really, really check it out, a lot of people pray. Pray before the basketball game. Pray before the football game. Pray before the track beat. Pray before the tennis match. The soccer game. I can, I can keep going on and on and on and on and on and on. But we pray and we believe God for things that have nothing to do with his work and nothing to do with his will. And we pray and we believe God for him to come through. And if you win, we say, yes, glory to God. He allowed me to come true. We get invested to the point. And then it becomes interesting now because you might have one team praying for God to win. And the opposite team who they're going up against is also praying to God for them to win. So who do God pick? Who does God pick to win? Who does God pick to lose? Because everybody's praying to God. I'm telling you, only God could be God. I couldn't be. I, I, don't, know, I don't know how you... Do, you, do I flip a coin and... <laughs> Everybody asking for God for, to do something. It just goes to show us how, uh, the, 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 how the, our belief in God and, and we sometimes as Christians, we, we, are, we still keep the world kind of faith. Where the world kind of faith means you believe in yourself. You believe in, 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 in humanity. You believe in, in, we call it humanism. You believe within yourself. And it makes sense, to be honest, because there is nothing else. If you're an unsaved person, what else do you have? That's why I don't get mad at them. Because unsaved people, what else do they have? They only have what they can see, what they can touch, what they can smell what they can hear, and what can, they can taste. So it's not surprising to hear an unsaved person push to the level where they're just like, I'm just going to believe within myself. I'm just going to believe in, so when I'm making my prayer, my supplication known, whether it's to God Almighty, to whoever they're making their prayer supplication to, they're just bringing their own desires and their own wants and their own this and their own that and everything about me. It's 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 about what I think, about what I want, what I want to do and everything. And I expect that however I am positioning my faith and my prayer, that it should get done because it's what I want. But how many of us know, how many of us know that's not how God works? God only works according to his will. God only works according to what he wants, what he desires, because he is perfect. Remember, we are growing from perfection unto perfection. And that first perfection is the justification by faith that when God sees us, he does see Jesus and we look perfect, but the reality is we have, we're, we're, sang, we're in the sanctification process, so that way our justification and our sanctification match. And every single day, we're going over it over and over and over again, so that way the, the, what God sees now, at the end of it all, what we actually are will match what God sees. That's the goal. So let's go to the next section now. The modern Christian and God's will. Now you might say, Minister, why do we keep saying the modern Christian? I have to say the modern Christian because we live in a world today where modernity, as good as it can be, has infiltrated the church to such a level that the church is starting to not look like the true church that it's supposed to be. The modern Christian and God's will. The Bible says that the spirit always wars against the flesh. All the time, from the moment we became saved, the battle began. From the moment we got saved. Or, as I like to put it, after the euphoria comes down. That after that initial, there's that initial joy of salvation that you just, you, you feel the burden lifted. You feel the... You, you, yes, I'm no, you now you feel God enter into you and, and it's something that's so brand new, something we've never experienced before on another level that, oh my gosh, 
But then the next day comes. And like the, the song was sung to, today, when Satan tries, he comes to tempt you. And he whispers and he tries to tempt me. And he, now, 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 now Satan. See, Satan wasn't really bothering us like that anymore because he, like, like Bishop always says, he already had us. But Satan's not bothered by people he already has. He already got you because he, he doesn't even have to say much. He'll just do it anyways. But now that we've entered into the newness of life now, now Satan actually has to put special attention on you and on me. Because now we have the ability to do what? Resist the devil. Before we didn't have the ability to resist the devil. Now with salvation we have the ability to resist him. And the Bible says if we resist him, he shall flee from us. So now not only do we have the power to resist, we have the power to make him flee. So now, like, so now he's dealing with now a new level of strength and a new level of ability that we never had before. So now he gives a special attention. So now the war begins now. now and, and not only does it begin with the enemy whispering in, uh, 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 to us, uh, it begins with the flesh and the own sin nature that's on the, on the inside of us uh, starts to fight back because now the spirit is saying, go to the right. Then the flesh is like, no, go to the left. And the flesh is saying, I've been doing this the whole time. Uh, we ain't never had no problem. When I said we're going to do this, uh, everybody said we're going to do this. And uh, when I said we're going to do that, uh, everybody said we're going to do that now you invited somebody else to the party and now when this person comes to the party he comes like how Jesus showed up to the temple and started casting out this and started casting out that and talking about now because our bodies is the temple of the most high God he's saying that now this house is the house of prayer and he's saying to the flesh you have made this house a den of thieves and the flesh is like what's the problem we've been doing this the whole time who are you and he says I am Jesus Jesus is us to kick everybody out. Who wants to get kicked out of their, their house? If you perceive that the house is yours, who wants to get kicked out? If I came into your homes, as much as I am Minister Nathan, if I came into your homes, packed up your stuff, and put it on the curb, anger and strife would begin. And if you don't want to say anything to me, Bishop phone don't stop ring. The house phone gonna ring. His cell phone gonna ring. If you got the email, you're gonna email too. Everybody said, Bishop, why your son come and pack up my stuff? What is this? Nobody likes getting kicked out of their own place. And that's how the flesh feels. The flesh is like, I'm getting kicked out of what I believe is mine. Because God's saying, this. no, 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 it's not yours. It is mine. God said, now that this body has come into salvation, it belongs to me. And the spirit now starts to war against the flesh. And the flesh starts to go against the spirit. And the two goes back and forth. And every day, every minute of the day, we are constantly making decisions that are either spirit-led or flesh-led. Every day we're making decisions on a constant. Every minute, every second that ticks by, a decision is either spirit-led, and when I say spirit-led, I mean Holy Spirit-led, because there are many other kinds of spirits out there. So the Holy Spirit-led, or it is flesh-led. Every single day. So, what is God's will? God's will can be summed up in these five statements, so grab your pens. Because to talk all of God's will here today, we're not going to go home. It's the truth. The whole Bible is God's will. All 66 books, the whole Bible. So if you're really going to, if you're going to ask me to go down deep into what God's will is, I mean, I could spend, I could take one verse and we can talk about God's will and it'll be two hours. And we still don't finish yet. But you can sum it up in these five pieces. Number one, God's commandments. That's the first one, God's commandments. Number two, God's statutes. God stat God's statutes. Number three, God's promises. God's 
promises. Number four, the salvation of mankind. Number four, the salvation of mankind. And then number five, the bride of Christ being brought into heaven. The bride of Christ being brought into heaven. I'm going to go over it one more time. Number one, God's commandments. Number two, God's statutes. Number three, God's promises. Number four, the salvation of mankind. Number five, the bride of Christ being brought into heaven. Those are the five general topics that you can find scriptures upon scriptures that would support each one. God's commandments, we can start right at the Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments are so strong now that they're no longer on tablets on stone, they're on the tablets of our heart. So now our very conscience, the basis of our very conscience that we have, and this is something that exists uh, um, whether you got salvation, yes or no, the very basis and foundation of it is the Ten Commandments. That's why when somebody lies, they know they're lying. When somebody steals, they know they're stealing, they know it's wrong. No one has to tell them that it's wrong. Their conscience lets them know that it is wrong because the, the Ten Commandments is now written on our heart. So our conscience now, even our very conscience, has a little bit of quickening to it based on what God did. God's statutes, what God stands for. It's one God. He's the only one that gets all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. It says, don't you know that I am a jealous God? Um, <clears throat> Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Righteousness and holiness, those are God's statutes. Clean hands, pure heart. They shall see God. Blessed are the meek. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed, blessed are those who, who hunger and thirst after stat statutes. Those are all of his statutes. Seek for me, you will find me. Knock, door shall be opened. The, the, these are God's statutes. That will, uh, have your bodies be laid as a living sacrifice. Every single day, holy and acceptable. Every single time. That's what God is saying. These are, these are what you are, this is what you have to live up to. This is the standard. If you want to even change that word, God's standard. That's a more easier word for you to, di to digest. The standard upon which God exists. He, 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 he is the same today. Yesterday. And forevermore. That's a statute. That's a standard. He, he makes the promise that if, if it happened back then, it can happen today, and it can happen in the future. I don't change. I, I, am, I am not this wishy-washy kind of God where as my emotions take me, I, I go there. As we as humans do, our feelings take us to and fro. He's like, no, 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 I remain. His promises. The songwriter says he promised to hold my hand. Promised to help me stand. He promised that when we go through the valley, he shall be with us. He said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's a promise. Jesus said unto them, and look at the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin, yet God takes care of all of them. If he takes care of them, won't he take care of you? That's what the Bible says. The salvation of mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's what he believed. That's what, that, that's, what the, that's what God stands his will is. The bride of Christ for he says, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can also be. You can be there also. You can be with me. <laughs> so I will go but I'm going to come again. I'm going to come to get you. I promise you. 
I'm leaving you, but I'm going to come back. You're going to see me again. I'm not leaving you here by yourself. And even though you die, I'm still coming back to get you. Because like he said, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him. That is God's will toward us. The Bible says, also another thing, sorry, also another part of it is truth. To understand God's will is to understand truth. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Because everybody wants to know what the truth is. Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6 to 7, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And if he had known me, he should have known my Father also. From, and from henceforth he know him and have seen him. Jesus, letting us know. So the very fact that we get to know Jesus, we know the Father. The very fact that we say, I, like the songwriter says, I feel Jesus, we feel the Father. If you know Jesus... You know the Father, because you can't even get to the Father unless you go through Jesus. Jesus is now our high priest, so no longer do we have to go to another man to go beg another man or another woman to go to, go, to, go, to, to make prior and offering and, and sacrifice for us. No, 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 no. We go directly to Jesus. We take our burdens to Jesus. And he brings us to the Father. And therefore, if you know Jesus, you know the Father. And that's why there will be no excuse on the judgment day. Because no longer can someone go to God and say, well, God, you didn't speak to me. What do you mean you didn't speak? Your son spoke to me. For my son spoke to you, I spoke to you. But Jesus, I don't No, 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 no. You do understand because the father and the son are one. You see, in humanity, father and son go butt heads sometimes. Daughter and mother go butt heads sometimes. Children and parents go butt heads sometimes. Jesus and God don't have that problem. There is no separation. No deviation. No pulling apart. They are one in the same. And when as, and if, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, syn- anybody ever go to the Olympics and watch synchronized swimming? You ever see the synchronized swimming? And the, the, the swimmers move. To exactly the same way together. You ever watch some people dance? Like a, a, a dance routine? And everybody, they arm move like, and everybody arm move like it's like it's one of the most amazing things to watch sometimes, like how synchronized. Nobody's fighting one another, they're all just lined up as exactly how God and Jesus is. And the Holy Spirit, too. All three in one. You can't go. You can't try to split them up and try to move one to the side here and push the other to the, put the other part here. No, no, no. They're all one and the same. So Jesus said, if you know me, you know the Father. You got no excuses. You got to know me, you know the Father. So we as Christians now in the modern day, the struggle we have is not so much in just believing It's about setting aside our will and allowing God's will to go forward. Going back to our main scripture, Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done. You see, we, since God can't operate outside of his will, it is, it is unreasonable for us to make a request of God that's outside of his will. It is unreasonable for us to make our prior request known to God around something that does not fall within his word, does not fall within his will, and then have the expectation that God will come through. And this is the interesting part. We will do that, have strong expectation for God to do something outside of his will and be disappointed when it doesn't happen. Yet for that which is in his will, that we should believe God for, we don't want to believe God for. And yet it is written down in his will. We don't want to believe God for a thing that is in his word that he promised would happen. 
And if you don't believe me, look at this past year. How many Christians find themselves turning them, turning their backs almost on God Almighty because we allowed a disease or a virus to come through and shake the foundations of our faith that we forget that God said none of the diseases that came upon the Egyptians shall come upon you. We forget about that. We forget all the fact that he said that healing is the children's bread. We forget that he said there's a time for every season under the sun, a time to live and a time to die. So what does that tell me? I could believe God all day to live to 500 and go dead one day. I could believe God to live like Methuselah. I'm still going to die one day. He said a time is appointed once to die and once to be born. He said I set the time. You get born on one day and you're going to die on the other. And the only way you don't die is if you get caught up in the rapture. Yeah, so anyway, anyways, right? So technically you die. Technically, it's true. The body, we don't know how it's going to look, but the point is that we leave behind the body. So technically speaking, the flesh body, we talk about dying. It's the flesh because your spirit doesn't die. It's your so you're still going to die at the rapture. However, how it's going to look. We, we, everybody imagines that we're just going to disappear at the face of the earth. Maybe our bodies get left behind. Maybe it looks like mass death. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me that. But for sure, the, this human body is not coming with us. Because nobody can live and see God. So this, this it, mortality has to put on immortality. So we, 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 we don't believe God for that which he put into his word. And says that when you are in the midst of the storm, I am going to be there with you. The, the, the waters will come nigh, but you ain't going to drown. The river might get high, but the, it, it, it won't overtake you. The fire going to burn, but you won't be burned. You'll be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the fiery furnace, uh, flame in front of you, flame behind you. Flame to the left of you, flame to the right of you. Flames above you, flames beneath you. They might be all around you, all entrapped in you, but you ain't burning because the fourth man has entered into the fiery furnace. And when the fourth man enters into the fiery furnace, you shall not be burned. That's what the Bible says, and yet we don't believe it. We believe God. Oh, Jesus. We believe God to keep us in our homes. I'm going to preach it. And believe that the Holy Spirit don't show up in our homes. And that is satisfactory enough. Can someone tell me? Did Paul and Silas remain in prison and say, it's all right. <laughs> they said that we're preaching against the, the Roman, you know, um, 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 religion and, and idea and we're stirring up problems. So it's all right. Technically speaking, you know, maybe we did break the law and, you know, it's all right. We, we, we can stay in prison. We're going to stay in here, in prison. The church will be all right. We, we taught people. We, uh, 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 we taught people how to minister. It's all right. They'll be okay. And the church, of course, just sat down and said, oh, they're in prison. God is with them. It's all right. It's all good. No, the church got down to pray. The church wanted them out of prison. The church wanted them back with the people of God. And the church got down to pray. And while they prayed, Paul and Silas in prison worshiped God. And they sang unto God. Because they said, even though we're in prison, 
We're going to sing unto God because God must hear us and God must deliver us. And because of the faith of Paul and Silas and the faith of the church believing that God was, has come to set at liberty them that are bruised, they come to break the chains, come to break the shackles. God came down and the earth started to shake and he broke the bonds and opened the prison doors and let the men of God free. He let them go free. But we believe that we can stay in the prison. Uh, you see, we don't even realize that they're making us prisoners in our own home. They are making us prisoners in our own homes. Because let me tell you something right now. It ain't good to be in your home all the time, man. I'm telling you. Have you ever met, have you ever met a hermit? Go on YouTube. Watch some videos on some hermits. And find out how, after being by themselves for so long, they have no idea how to interact with society. And you know, some of them, they used to interact with society, you know, so it wasn't like they grew up in it. They used to interact, they were used to people, but whatever happened in their lives, they decide, I'm going to be a hermit. First of all, let's, let's forget about human interaction for a moment. In terms of friends and family. You go isolate yourself. First of all, all of us of us as Caribbeans, we don't like stinking bread. All right, you can say silent, but we don't like stinking bread. I'm being very serious. And when we don't like stinking bread, now you tell me now, if a hermit is living by themselves, where are they going to get the toothpaste from? And the toothbrush. When are they going to see the dentist? To go make sure their mouth is in order. Before they know it, their mouth stink. Oh, they have river. That's good they have river. River is full of bacteria. Oh, they have river. Where is the soap? Because I was told that some of you used to wash clothes at the riverside. But you had soap. I never hear nobody said I just went to the riverside and grabbed my clothes. No scrubbing board, no soap, and just washed them in it clean. No, it might have been riverside, but you got your soap, you got your scrubbing board. And you clean your clothes. But to get the soap, you gotta go to the store, you gotta go to market. To get the scrubbing board, you gotta go to the store. Gotta go. I didn't grow up down there. I'm just telling you what I heard. Oh, okay. Gotta go to the market or find somebody that got it. Right. And when you need to iron your clothes, okay, you can't iron the way you want to, but you get a piece of, piece of metal, a piece of iron, let it sit out in the sun, get hot, and then take it. What's my point? Even to do the simple things of just keeping yourself, it requires human interaction. So when I, when, I, when, I, when I got the hermit, then I realized that's not the kind of way to live. No. It's really, really not. But in this modern society, making us prisoners in our own homes, <laughs> making us to let fear, Jesus said, you shall not have the spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind hold it together because I am with you and the same God that allowed Peter to step out of the boat and walk on the water is the same God that can hold our minds and our hearts together we treat the house of God, Christianity on a whole now, start to treat the house of God like it's the plague. I mean, some of us were just now coming back, true, thank God, but I mean, we're going to treat the house of God like it's the plague. And I'm not talking about following the ordinance of the, of the government. That's one thing. Because the Bible does make provision for that. 
So we're not talking about that. I'm talking about when that gets removed and you're, uh, you're able to start to come in. People treating the house of God like it's a plague, but yet you're still going to the supermarket and you're still going to Home Depot uh, and you're still going to get something to eat. Oh, we're eating outdoors. All right, fine. I will get a speaker and put it outside. If you won't be outside, but come to the house of the Lord. You want to worship outside? We'll put a speaker out there. I'll get a television if I have to. And put it out there if you want to be outside. But we don't know. I'm going to be at home. Let me tell you something. We're at home for the past year or so. When I started going back to the office because of they allow us, as long as you just fill out the sheet and, you know, fill out the questionnaire and, and, there's, and there's a spot available, you're able to come in. Do you know how nice it was to go into the office? Now listen to me. I'm not saying that working from home isn't nice too. It has its perks. But let me tell you something. I went into the office and there was a situation and the customer is screaming and they're yelling. I'm not going to go into the reason why they're screaming and yelling. The bottom line is they're screaming and yelling. And it was so nice to be in the office. Let them bad spirit and them bad yelling and cuss word go into the office. Because when I leave and I go home, my atmosphere is not convoluted. When you work from home, you have to pray two and three times more because, my goodness, the atmosphere gets contaminated. I'm not talking about unsafe people. I'm talking about a Christian person. Our atmosphere becomes contaminated. Gets contaminated because of everybody who's talking through the Zoom or through the Skype. Or to the Google Meet. And listen, you can't control people and tell them don't cuss no bad word. If they're going to cuss bad word, they're going to cuss bad word. That's what they're used to. When you were in the office, it happened. But at least if I go into the office and you cuss bad word, it stays in the office. And believe it or not, the commute, as much as long as it can be sometimes, is actually kind of nice. It gives you a little detox moment, a little moment to come. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It gives you a moment to calm down, man. Just being on the train or driving back home, man. I get to, ay, 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 ay. I, I'm going home to do more work, you know. I still have more work to do, but I'm like, running, running too, man. And, and I could put on my Bible or put on some gospel music and just, ay, 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 me and Jesus. But when you're stuck at home, there's none of that moment. Everything just mix up, mix up, mix up, mix up, mix up. And I realized the relief. That I, now, I like the option to stay at home because it's nice enough. Maybe if I'm tired tomorrow morning after preaching, I can work from home. It's, it's, that part is nice, and, but then I'm meant to prepare for that. But then it's still good when I can go into the... It's coming into the house of God. Me can't run up like that, up and down like this in my apartment like that, man. Everybody, the, the downstairs neighbor going to wonder, call the landlord and wonder, why is this man running on top of me? And every minute, so he might run up on top. But in the house of God, I got freedom to worship God in the liberty and in the beauty of holiness. I can worship him in spirit and in truth. Ain't nobody going to, go, no, nobody can hold me back. I can worship God. I can praise my God. Let me, can I testify today? Today, we ain't got no drama today. And we're trying to do the praise and worship. And I said, God, this can't work. So I said, God, you bless me. God, you bless me. You bless me to play keys. And you bless me to play drum. I said, God, I'm grabbing the bass drum. And me on the keys and on the bass drum. Because one way or another, we're going to praise God. It ain't going to be perfect. It ain't going to be everything I want it to be. But I believe God. They praise him on the high sounding cymbals. Praise him in the timbrel and dance. I believe God. That even if I don't have everything. If I extend my faith according to his will. And according. 
according to his word. God will. God will. God will. He will bring it to pass. I believe God according to his will. Because he wrote it, I believe it. He said it, I believe it. And he said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter, because I come to praise God. So yes, is that the full drum? The way I want it to be. But it's the bass drum. And it hold the fort. Hold the fort. For I am coming. And I called Minister Hendricks and Miss Hendricks, grab the claves, grab the tambourine. It ain't going to be perfect, but we're going to worship God today. And I watch God. I watch God. I watch God. I watch God. Because I believe him and I trust him according to his will. So no longer is it about what I want. It's not even about my own, you see, when your will is involved, your strength gets involved. And your strength, the Bible says, Matthew 26, 41, watch him pray that he enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. When our will is what is driving the prior, it's weak. It's very weak. But the spirit is strong. Galatians 5, 16, 17. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and he shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary from one to the other, so that he cannot do the things that he would. Can't believe God and pray to God for things that don't line up in his will. And then don't want to pray to God for things that are in his will. Because we want to live a full and prosperous life, but be spiritually dead. That's his own message in and of itself. But I'll say the statement one more time so it remains with you and it remains with me. We, I said we, want to live a full and prosperous life. God said, I wish above all things that he be in health. That he prosper and be in good health. But as your soul, how does one going to prosper? Only through the spirit. But we only look at the physical things, the, the jacket and the flowers and the, and the food building and everything. We want to prosper with money. We never done want to stop wanting for money. Everybody want to be able to have money. Everybody want to be able to have things. And, so, and we want to live this full and prosperous life. And we so badly want to be like Solomon. Good heavens, man. If someone preach on Solomon one more time, well, it just drives me crazy. We don't preach on the wisdom of Solomon. We preach on what Solomon have. We preach on the fact that he got gold. And he got money. And he got concubine. And he got all this type of stuff. We don't preach on his wisdom. But we preach on everything that he's got. Oh, the blessings of Abraham. Oh, the blessings of Abraham. The blessing, the blessing, the blessing, the blessing. Shut up! Solomon said all his vanity and vexation of spirit. Abraham made a big mistake and to this blessed day the two brothers are still fighting one another. We can't get no peace. Look over in Afghanistan. The blessings of Abraham. I'm not preaching against it. Because we need it, but my goodness, he made one blunder. Until this blessed day, we are still dealing with it. It will only end when Jesus comes. So we, we, preaching on all these different things. I'm not talking about the wisdom of Solomon. What Solomon he tells you after he gained everything and he realized, oh my gosh, this ain't worth it. So he started talking to, so talk to us now. Start talking to us and saying, listen, I gained it all, but I'm telling you, <laughs> I gained it all, but it ain't worth it. And let me tell you why it's not worth it. And let me tell you what I learned while gaining all of these things. Yes. These things that God hates. Yes. Be careful of this kind of woman. Yes. I mean, I mean, these are the things. The Proverbs 30, well, I'm a woman. 
and how she ought to be arrayed and what kind of wife she is. All of these things wrote Solomon laid out after he lived his life and gained all of these things and, all, and he laid it out for us. But we don't want to preach on that. What we want to talk about is our pocket. Shut up! Because all of that means nothing if we're spiritually dead. All of that means nothing if the spirit of God is not working on the inside of us. I am sounding brass and tinkling cymbal if the anointing is not in the preaching. I could scream until I go hoarse and nobody would say anything. You know why? Because there is no anointing. But I promise you this. Even a whisper will we reach the hearts of the people. When, when God called Samuel, he said, I'm going to give you a word that will make every ear that hears it tingle. Because the anointing is upon the word. So we got to believe, we, we believe God according to his word. Get back into his will. When we pray, and that's the reason why no matter what, I end every prayer. God, no matter what I ask you for, because I'm human and I'm going to ask you for stuff. It's going to happen. You know it's going to happen. But not my will. Thy will be done. Every time I go to God, I say, God, not my will, but thy will be done. God, in this situation, your perfect will be done. In this request, your perfect will be done. Sometimes... After a while, when you've been praying the same prayer over and over and over again, you say, God, you know the situation already. That Thy will be done. You just, you just give it up. <laughs> you don't even go into the DC. It's God, because at this point you're saying, God, whatever you're going to do is going to be perfect for me. Because you've proven it in the past. That when, you're done, when your will is done in my life, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm good. As a matter of fact, I'm better than good. I'm amazing. I'm great. I'm awesome. I feel wonderful. Because your will is done in my life. And it's and funny enough, when God's will is done, it satisfies us, you know. Stand with me. Singers, come back. Yeah. When God's will is done, we're satisfied. We're satisfied. That's the really crazy thing about it when you really think about it. We out here resisting me too. Let me stop talking about you. Let me talk about me. Let me resist God's will when I'm ready. But yet, when God's will get done, I feel good. There's a level of satisfaction. A level of glee. It's hard to put. I'm, I'm using the best words that I can to just try to explain it to you, but it's, it's hard. Yeah. And you, you know, after you eat some good food, and you sit back in your chair and you relax, that's, how, that, that, that's the closest thing when, you, when God's will is done in your life. And you sit down, and your spirit sit down, and you feel good, and you know. Like, you know, God is proud of me. God is pleased with me. I mean, there is no higher cloud nine than when God is pleased. There is no higher moment in your life than when God is truly pleased with you. And you know it. And you feel it. And you hear it. And you taste it. And everyone's looking at you. Because you're not there. You're there, but you're not there, you know. You're, 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 you're just wrapped up in the presence of God right there. Because you know God is pleased. And everyone's trying to figure out what's going on with you. And you're like, it's not for you. This is for me. Because God is pleased. We need to believe God according to his will. Jesus said, not my will. Give us everyone going to die. Oh, but Samuel, Jesus knew he was going to come back and raise from the dead. <laughs> All right. Whoever want to sign up for the pain, put your hand up. <laughs> because even when we know we're going to get through it, <clears throat> we don't want to go through the pain. I've had, I've had a brother tell me <laughs> that they avoid the gym. Not because the gym is not good for them and that the gym wouldn't help them. But they said the very first day I go, when it is over, and when the next day come, and when that pain hits my body. The gym is good. It gives fitness and strength and health to the body. It's very, very good, especially over the long term. But man, if you haven't gone for a while, 
in that first day. And I'm not even going to lie to you. The problem is not when you're sore after the workout. That's the least because your adrenaline is going. You're good. It's when you wake up the next morning. And when you go, yeah, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Going into work, everyone trying to wonder why. Nothing, nothing wrong with you, but why? <laughs> because you, you work out in your body. So, if, if we didn't, so even though we know it's good for us, Jesus knew that he was going to raise from the dead. He knew it was going to happen. But that doesn't mean he wants to get beaten, wants to get nailed to a cross, that he actually wants to go through death. Who wants to go through death? Even if you know you're going to rise again. Nobody in here wants to die. I know that for a fact. Nobody in this place wants to die. So when Jesus said, not my will, but thine be done, putting aside what he wants, saying, God, I know what the bigger plan is. I trust in your plan. And I believe you to take me through. Because at the end of the day, even though he was Jesus, he was still man at that time. He wasn't God literally going to die on the cross. He was still man, God as man, going to die on the cross. And he looked and he said, I'm gonna be- God, I believe you according to your will. And it worked out for our benefit. Now we have this full and free salvation that we don't have to pay for. We gotta believe God according to his will. Trust God according to his will. And start to say, God, I, 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 whatever your will is, I'm gonna believe you for it to happen. I'm gonna trust you for it to happen. If it means I need to adjust myself, I'm gonna do it. Because it's about your will anyways. How do I get into heaven? God's will. I don't get into heaven on my own will. I get to heaven because of God's will. He is the one that makes. I don't get Bishop to go in front of God and say, God, this is my argument. This is my petition. This is my affidavit. These are my filing papers. God will look at us like, what papers? Either your name's in the book of life or it's not. No, some people, I really think that we think we're going to be able to reason with God. When we get down here, is for the reasoning. And let me be very clear for all of us, because especially for me too. The reasoning is not for us to look at God and say, well, God, I, you know, compromise here, 50% here and 50 No, the reasoning is for us to lay down our will and pick up God's will. When he said, let's reason together, he, Jesus is saying, I am talking to you to persuade you to my will. This is not for you to tell me your will. I already know your will. I know what you want. I know what you think. I know, what, I know everything about you. This is me just trying to bring you to the bigger picture so you have a better understanding so that when you gain reasoning and you gain wisdom, you will start to understand why my will is better and you will make the choice to step in to my will that is God's will. It's all about God's will because saints I could be sick if God doesn't want to heal me I'm not getting healed I could be poor and poor poor till poor can't come no more and if God doesn't desire for me to be rich I am not going to be rich see we don't we don't want to hear this kind of reality and if God doesn't want to give us the promotion, or he said that's not the right promotion for you, you're not going to get it no matter how hard you work for it. God is will. Whatever God's will is, his will ought to be done. So no matter what we want, what we think, or how we feel, and what's going through our minds and everything, that we're, no, it's all about God's will. And it is high time. That we stop wasting faith. Stop wasting our faith in things that are not God's will. And believe. And let me tell you something. You know, God is merciful, you know. It's a good thing he's a merciful God. God comes through us and answers certain things because of his mercy. And even then, that's still his will. Even when God is being merciful, he decides to be merciful. Mercy didn't show up and say, all right, God's will, go to the corner. No, 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 no. It was God's will to exercise mercy. So everything is God's will. 
So it's time for us, saints. I encourage you, encourage myself, encourage you. Stop wasting our, our faith and getting discouraged. But put our faith in the hand of the man that still the waters. Put our faith in his will. Put, you, we want to see God work? Put our faith in his will. Because God promised you, if you believe me, according to my will, if you ask anything in my name, when we call the name of Jesus, uh, uh, can I take five more minutes here? Because this needs to be said. When we call the name of Jesus, it is not some one-trick pony. That anything I ask God for, I just call Jesus' name and it's going to happen. I've come to the realization that some people think that you can fool God. And that you can pull out what they call spiritual tricks. And that you can pull out spiritual... Um, and nobody is out dealing God at the table. Nobody is outsmarting God at the table. Nobody is fooling God at the table. We're out, we are outsmarting ourselves. We are fooling our own selves. And we are out dealing ourselves. We are hurting ourselves. Nobody is outdoing God. Hands are too short to box with him. So when God, when God now is dealing with us, we have to do it according to his will. Because when his will is done, it is yay and it is amen. Stand with me today. I encourage all of you who are watching to remain in God's will. I encourage each and every one of you that when you pray, you make sure you end. If you don't say it at all, make sure you end with God, your will be done. Because only when God's will is done, then things, then the right thing will come to pass, even if it's not what we prayed for. Because God's will is the only will that matters. That's how we live, that's how we die, and that's how we make it into heaven. So let's get down into God's will. Stop wasting our faith. Our put our faith into his will so he can work properly in our lives according, again, to his will. Hallelujah. Take it to buy heads and close your eyes. All righteous and Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your power again, Jesus. Lord, I ask you again, Jesus, first, Lord, to touch all the faith worship sent to saints, God, who couldn't make it here today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your hand of mercy, Lord, and your hand of strength that was upon your people. Send healing, deliverance, Lord, strength, Lord, and power into your people. Help them, Lord, to walk in your will. Help them, Lord, to follow, Lord, your will. Help them, Lord, to believe you, Lord, according to your will. And to make sure, God, that in every prayer and every supplication that they ask, that your perfect will be done. Strengthen, Lord, even right now, again, Jesus. Bless them, Lord, throughout this entire week again, Lord. Be ever close to them again, Lord. And keep, Lord, their eyes stayed on thee. Touch all those who, all the visitors, Lord, who are watching, Lord, first time, second time, third time, and whatever time, Lord, visitors again. We thank you, Lord, for allowing them to tune, tune in, Lord, to the Hour of Faith broadcast. Heal your people again, Lord. Bless your people, Lord. Save those that need to be saved. Let salvation enter into their hearts. Bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray again, Lord. And keep them, Lord, throughout this entire High week, Lord, and let them keep their eyes on you. Thank you, Lord, for doing it one more time. As we look to you again, let your perfect will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Tune in next week to our faith broadcast. You have a blessed week. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together. Put your hands together.